<laughs> this is the Neo Books call on Monday, March 11th, 2024. Um, I'm laughing a little bit because now I have to turn on four things at the start of every Zoom call. Uh, I'm trying to do so automatically. It turns out to be problematic. So, hey, here we are. Um, I was laughing because Dave asked if that baton was sharp. That's why I was laughing. It's not give, sharp. You don't want to give Jerry anything sharp. No, it's not sharp. Don't run with scissors. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm of the school of try to reduce all the accidents before they happen if you can. So, so for instance, there's there's like a no fly zone over laptops where if any liquids are being passed around, they can't fly over the keyboard. <laughs> Okay, that just just trying to minimize the odds that something awful is going to happen. Um, Claudia Spence uh, got to go out to Camp David a couple of times with different kinds of retreats when she was working back in the White House, and she there's a big sign on the wall that has all the things that you are not allowed to do at the camp at Camp David. You can't race the go the golf carts. You can't play you know bumper car with the golf carts. You can't you know. And it's like, and, it's, and, the, and the, the major who runs the place was saying, yeah, every one of those has a story, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. I bet. There's only a rule to not do bumper cars with the, with the golf carts because somebody wants. Yeah. Exactly. There were, there were once bumper car races. And all there. it does is inspire other people um, to want to do bumper cars, of course. But wouldn't have thought of it before, but now it's there on the wall. I mean, hey. Um, how is everybody? Good. Fucking along. Um, spring is arriving in Oregon. Very happy about that. Today's rainy, but tomorrow goes to 70 something and then it gets really, really nice. So I think, uh, good weather has arrived here. Don't know about everywhere else. Y'all feeling spring? It's in San Diego where it's very spring, like much of the time. Palm Springs is not so bad either. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, cool. Uh, and I was just saying at the very top of the call that um, I was trying to come up with a series, I was trying to nuggetize a narrative to explain neobooks as recorded videos. And I started getting distracted by the many different things that thread together into, into those. But it's my intention to do some some of what we talked about last time, which was, hey, Neobooks need, needs an introduction um, and to produce uh, those things. Uh, and I don't know exactly where we'd want to pick up on what we've got going so far. Yeah, I don't know. If I, I had a kind of a, a little, I don't know if it's an epiphany exactly, but I, an experience last week that I was just going to recount for you. Please. Um, talking with Michael Lennon. I might have talked about this a little bit last week too, but it's still present with me. I talked with Michael Lennon about a session that's been going on in the GRC around a regenerative economics. So the, the the Pam and Tanusha have been leading the session for over a year now. So there's probably, I don't know, 50 or 60 episodes of this session, most of which have been recorded. And Michael, I think in particular, has got some energy to do some kind of a public something with these things. I mean, we started out talking about it as a book. And I think Michael's been talking to you some, Pete, I maybe... Um, so, you know, this is all kind of all the threads are crossing a little bit, but I was struck um, by kind of two dimensions of it. I mean, I've thought of the Neo books as kind of getting a book out to share information. I was struck that actually the process of creating the content is also a good way to activate people like in the GRC. Um, and so we have a topic area, this regenerative economics thing that a lot of people have been discussing from different perspectives. You know, there's kind of a notionally you could have like people writing chapters or anything, something like that. But I was thinking, well, not gosh, I mean, you know, if somebody, if we could, if people were motivated, we could have like somebody running the podcast and somebody putting out the newsletter and they don't even have to be all that tightly correlated, really. I mean, they're, they might be pulling from the same kind of pattern and maybe we're, maybe there's a rhythm to it or maybe not, you know, somebody else is writing the book and there's chapters and the chapters are stolen by the people who are doing the podcast and they're, you know, I don't know, or, or chapters end up with research, which is interviewing somebody for the podcast that shows up in the chapter. And there's, there's, I don't know, kind of energy going around through the system, but maybe not all that highly 
uh, coordinated. You know, it, you, maybe you just have six different teams kind of around the same topic area. And then from my perspective, you've energized the teams. You've probably explored the topic better. People probably have learned. You know, there's a lot of it in a GRC context. It's just people learning kind of for themselves and with each other. So the same thing I think we're doing in the conversations. So you could almost argue that the public public uh, release is bonus. You know, that's the, that's the, that's the, you know, but you get the value just out of the process in some sense. Um, so I, I was going to try to encourage maybe something like that from this GRC effort. Uh, I don't know how closely correlated it should be with this group, but um, anyway, so that, that was kind of the, the notion. So I, th I think Dave, what you're describing is a really nice use case for neo books in the way that we're talking about them. Um, makes total sense. And um, Pete, did this kick up any thoughts for you about uh, how we might go about doing something like this? It uh, sounds really smart. I mean, at, at the current state, what this means is GRC people um, learning how to put markdown documents on GitHub, I think, because that's practically the way we're doing uh, NeoBooks. Um, but other than that, um, it's like, come on down and play. I, I would say that a, a little differently. Yeah. Um, the workflow that we've got involves markdown documents on GitHub. And that's one way that people can participate. But if they have already got a workflow, they like Google Docs or um, sending stone tablets to each other or whatever, uh, we can work on adapting that to to what we're doing. Yeah, I had a I had a conversation with Jordan this morning, uh, which was on the Palouse project, but also um, the Neobook concept came up because um, we we really need to use AI. You know the the uh, I mean the, the topics we're working on. Um, we 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 need to have AI support to enhance uh, to enhance this effort here. And <clears throat> when you when you look at how how this technology is advancing, my son, for example, you know he works for Sam Sarah as head of corporate talent branding. They are actually training a chat GPT uh, enterprise. This company, right? They're uh, using a chat GDP, GDP enterprise to train up for what are very technical uh, issues, you know, because they're developing a knowledge base on on basically linear optimization, you know, movement, and so on. And so the 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 um, the challenge right now really is to train chatbots to be specialists in a specific topic, industry knowledge bases and, and what have you. And I come back to the Google team that trains uh, uh, an AI to win the uh, against the Go master, right? So you have a team that was training this AI. So we, so I'm my uh, imagination has really been captured by training this AI. So the entire Neo book uh, that I've developed now, phase one and now phase two, really is what this AI has come to think, right? Because I started with the, the dawn of everything, 10,000 years of, of, of agriculture, the evolution of agriculture, the integration of food and agriculture into culture, uh, into uh, the survival of civilizations, way, way, way back. Uh, now up to uh, the integration of social systems, change management, and all of that. So this AI is now uh, uh, highly trained, you know, in in looking at food issues from multiple perspectives. And so, and and so we we get we are already communicating through it, right? I mean, we we are running every contract or every major discussion through the AI right now because it's just. Uh, blows up your your ability. Uh, it's an enhancement, really. That's that's not how we're looking at it. But it also turns out that the AI is completely dependent on who programmed it, right? So it's the the the, the integrity and quality of the programming team really determines the reliability of output from this AI. So if you are missing to 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 frame it incorrectly. 
it may start hallucinating because it may come up with things that uh, are outside uh, the periphery of, of where you would want it contained. So that's where 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 I'm really are now is I, I need to get out with this thing. I can't you know I have I have this sitting there. Um, I'm working with farmers uh, and I'm working with people who are not going to go into GitHub. Uh, they need they need a, a different type of interface that is more user friendly, more practical. Yeah, um, and and that's probably true for. Uh, a, a lot of other menus, not just farmers. So I'm sort of really, you know, where are we going? What are, what are we doing with this thing? Is is you know, and I really uh, would like us to to see what are we can we take this for a test ride? I mean, are we ready to move somewhere with this? Um, great questions, Klaus. I think Pete and Pete and Stacy have questions and answers. Um, uh, so I hear you, Klaus. Um, uh, AI is an important power tool, I, I would say. So I don't disagree. Um, I, I think, I, I'm not sure. So I teach people to use AI, um, LLMs, and image generators. Uh, so I've had a fair amount of experience with people learning how to use LLMs, learning you know, learning that they're not very interested in an LLM, something like that. Um, the way I look at AI in general is uh, it's a power tool. Um, it helps you do stuff a lot faster, a lot better. So if that stuff is text or if that stuff is images, it just kind of makes sense that you would do it. At the same time, I, I know there are people who, who for, for whom that, that decision uh, seems very quick. Um, and so they want to tiptoe into using AI along with people. Um, so I, I think that's one thing. Uh, I, I think it's important to recognize that some people are ready to and some people aren't. And also that I agree with you, it's very important if you've got uh, something that needs to be done quick, uh, teaching a bunch of people about um, uh, regenerative ag or <clears throat> um, or whatever, social justice or whatever, you might as well use a power tool and instead of not using a power tool. Um, you, you focused in on specifically uh, training uh, or uh, tuning, fine tuning an LLM to be, uh, to have a certain set of knowledge. Um, that's, I, I think that's one way to use a, an AI and there are other ways to use it. Um, you might use a general purpose AI in lots of different ways. You'd probably use both of them together, a, a fine tuned one and a general purpose one. So I think there's a larger, a larger talk there about what you would do with an LLM and, and why, why you would do it and how successful you expect it to be it. And, and you'd want to feed that process knowledge back into how you're using an AI. Um, and I would love to have that conversation, probably not within neobooks. <laughs> um, uh, another another thing you said at the at the very end is, can we just start doing something? Um, I think to go back to what Dave said, I think Dave actually had a pretty good example of of what we could do, right? And it's um, <clears throat> Dave, I really like the way you sketched out um, a vision of actually doing something. Uh, uh, having it be multimodal, um, and maybe a key part is not to worry too much about how how that is coherent, uh, you know, around a, a particular topic. Um, I think that's a great approach. Um, uh, I th I th and I think I think Neobook should think about that seriously and and continue to kind of evolve that idea. Um, the question for me, um, Dre, you really quickly asked, Pete, what do you think? I said it was a good idea. The, the second part of that answer is how does, you know, you know, so maybe kind of the way, the way Klaus said it. So when do we start, you know, um, uh, who's, uh, who's showing up? every week or every other week or whatever rhythm it is to actually do that on some topic, right? And so maybe it's a com combination of the Neobooks team and the GRC team or, or however it works out, you know, 
maybe it's a newly chartered team pulling people from NeoBooks and from GRC and from, from other places. Uh, the AI, AI anthology team is, is another team that Michael Lennon and I share um, and has been working on book publishing. Um, and you know, we're now we're wondering how do we take uh, a paper book, ebook? What's the next thing? Is it a video, um, or is it a podcast? Or how do we how do we get people to read the book that we wrote? Um, how do we do marketing around it? Anyway, I, I I like where you're going with that, Dave. And the the next question is, has somebody raised their hand and and said, okay? This is I'm, I'm going to take over in the Neo Books meeting, and this is what we're doing next week. We're working on blah, um, or I raise my hand and you know I'm going to have meetings on this day at this time, and we're going to be doing that work. Um, and the first the first outputs are podcasts and, and you know blog posts. Uh, we'll borrow um, Neo Books's Substack and and use that or whatever, right? So you know uh, let's do it. Um, I'm, I won't be pro probably part of that. I'm happy to help on tools um, and processes and, and stitching together other communities. Um, but the content part of that project, I probably won't be doing. But I recognize the need for somebody to be doing it. Um, Stacey, do you want to, are you replying to costs or is it a different topic? No, same topic. To Perfect. All, everything. Then, then I will go after you. Thank you. Um, so I agree with everything that's been said. Um, yesterday when I was tossing and turning though, I, so I'm, I'm just want to add something. I'm not negating anything that was said. I was lying in bed and I was thinking, I don't want AI to tell me what to do. I want to tell it what to do. And towards the idea of what Dave's talking about, what I mentioned Jerry, to you, Jerry and Pete, before the call, that idea, to me, that the way I saw that is the convening of people, but then people that are focused on AI would be there either watching the conversation and doing whatever it is they do that's from the AI side. There'd be other people interacting from whatever, whatever they take what they need from the conversation. So again, all everything that I've heard all these ideas put together and the idea of doing something, that's what I, th what I would like to see happen because we already have our relationships. We're already in different places showing up for whatever reason. And sometimes it's a little more of one, sometimes it's a little more of another. So I just, I'll stop there. Thanks, Jesus. Uh, let me, Go back to Klaus's question and see if I can maybe glue together some of what all of us have been saying a little bit. Uh, Klaus, it feels like you're saying, hey, um, connecting up AIs to bodies of work, bodies of knowledge is essential. And it's it's like a fast way forward. Um, to me, I think some, I, I, and I'm forgetting who, what, where, but I think some of us are pretty close to, uh, Pete has been trying to make a, G a GPT talk to my brain. That is down the road from what you're saying, which is, hey, here's a corpus of known texts. Let's let's use that as a corpus for a narrowly focused GPT. And I don't know which or who of us has actually done that already. Pete, is that a is that a, uh, a feature we've conquered already? Because um, Klaus, you're, you're busy sort of coaching GPT and asking your questions in a particular way, but have we built GPTs? Uh, this domain? team, this team has not. Um, the, right. yeah. So the idea of of building a a bot, a chatbot with a corpus, um, has been standardized. Uh, anybody can do that with uh, make with OpenAI just by making a GPT. Um, Poe and Flow GPT are 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 GPT competitors, so you right. can do it with them too. And Klaus, you you've actually done that, right? You've created a GPT that's connected yeah, to that I body have. of work. I have a book reviewer, which I demonstrated a few times. I have right. a personal advisor, uh, which I, uh, which is uh, uh, really uh, very interesting. Uh, I've set up one for the Palouse project. So, so you, so there is a you know, very specific training, but I have a foundation that I'm using in each for each uh, uh, GPT to to lay in a framework, you know, so sort of a box of algorithms and, and stories and so on. 
the the, the, the practical output here, for example, is we, we had a conversation about uh, protein in crops, right? So to, to create uh, protein uh, uh, output from uh, uh, in the Palouse, what are grain cores, you know, what types of crops uh, could they call that, that are protein rich? And it takes this thing five seconds and you got a list of, uh, you know, what you can call and what the protein content is and how you rotate them. So the 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 research power and the knowledge base that is inherent in this thing right now is amazing. Right. And so if you can structure it in a way where a farmer feels competent and confident enough to go and just ask a simple question, you know, what what crop could I use for blah blah blah? I mean, that's amazing stuff. You know? And so the the because right now this is all time consuming, but the interface would have to be engaging simple you know maybe maybe uh, you can talk uh, your question rather than typing it and and those kinds of things so that's sort of wh wh what i'm what i'm envisioning because i mean the the these are all very smart people uh, they are actually i mean farmers are actually super in, engaged in applied technology right i mean they're using gpt self-driving tractors and what have you um they're actually pretty good in in deploying technology once they get the hang of it and, and get to understand it. And I think that this tool uh, is it can be a game changer, you know, in the regenerative frame, um, particularly because the, the the way we are thinking about connecting uh, farmers with markets with uh, CPG, uh, consumer packaged goods manufacturers, right? So to to so it's a very technical knowledge base, but that goes further because I also want uh, this this uh, AI to think about the socioeconomic impacts of decisions, right? So you want to be community specific. You want to input uh, the variables by community that make the AI aware of uh, of things that no one right now even considers, right? How many jobs do you gain and lose, and how could you? break this function down into more small scale businesses. And so there are all kinds of, of opportunities available for that. So now going back to what Dave was saying a moment ago, um, I think the process Dave was describing of a community um, coming together to uh, write pieces, items, uh, nuggets or whatever about a particular topic, let's say regenerative economics uh, and share them is is the process of learning about those issues, improving those issues, and basically creating a corpus. And, and I think that um, just, just like Neobooks thinks of a book as a particular set of nuggets serialized in a particular order so that they look like a book, similarly, uh, a, a set of nuggets could act as a corpus for a GBT. But the creation of the corpus, I think is really actually not only important in the sense of, gosh, we need to have some information to point this thing to, but in the social sense of community building, trust building, and in the the improvement of the work itself, of, of the corpus. So what I'm trying to steer toward is, I think that this is, I'm really interested in the human and AI collaboration, how these things all dovetail together in some way that gives you, Klaus, a chat like access to really great bodies of work that can answer questions for people who just want to do that, but that also has the community side of people developing the corpus that the chat is based on and always improving it. And I, Dave, I think sort of that, that's a piece of what you were talking about is, is like, hey, we get, we get lots of people interested in these topics. Some of them are just busy learning and ramping up to the topic. Others of them are actually improving the thing and making the corpus really good. And Pete, the reason I was asking, asking you who had sort of done this and class that, that you have done this was that the GPT capacity becomes a generalizable thing you do with any corpus that you've developed that could be any community's body of work. And that's how you sort of define the boundaries of what the GPT is good at. It's like, hey, over here, there's a body of, of knowledge that we're thinking of as, uh, as, a, as a corpus for some reason, because it's vertically interesting and deep. Uh, did that make sense? So I'm, I'm trying to say both sides of this are really important, the social human side, as well as the, the AI GPT side. And there's a way of thinking about this that generalizes it so that 
aiming at GPT at a corpus becomes yet another manifestation of the work we're doing together to create bodies of, of knowledge. Yeah, I, mean, I think, right, go ahead, Dave. Uh, yeah, I think, I mean, so I guess I'm probably um, less confident still in the nuggets notion. I feel that, I feel like the, what I'm imagining is probably messier than that. It's, you know, there's, there's not going to be a core repository necessarily. There'll be value in several different, uh, so I'm probably organizing it, thinking in my head more like media channels. And in my framing of this, I would say the AI is another media channel. Or, or what way to say it is a work team, right? There's a podcast team and an AI team and a book team. They're all working on the same general area, producing and learning and, you know, kind of co-informed, in, um, but they have their own deliverable kind of, you know, so like there's one team that really wants to put out a book, but there's another team that's really interested in the AI, you know, and those are, that's great. Because one of the things I, so I'm kind of, I'm, I'm influenced by two things. One is just, the frustration with all the channels, right? And I feel like we can't choose a channel anymore. You have to do all of them, kind of. Right. Um, and um, and in particular, trying to reach people, but there's no one channel to reach anybody. You know, I can't communicate with the GRC. There's no way to kind of get everybody's attention. Um, you must feel the same way, Jerry. It's like, you know, there's just, you know, there's just no, there's no way. Um, so there's, there's so, that's, so, that's, so my response has been, well, you then you have to do all the channels. And so can you, how do you create a structure that does all the channels? Well, you do distribute the teams. Um, and, and then the other piece of it that, that I've been, I have been thinking for a long time that we wanted a regenerative media alliance. There's a lot of people out there producing stuff now. Mm -hmm. We should mm -hmm. aggregate those people so that we somehow amplify the effect. And I still wonder if Neobooks couldn't have a similar kind of role there where you're, you are the publisher that somehow making your authors more successful because somehow you aggregate publishers or you aggregate authors. And so the regenerative media Alliance notion was simply pushing out existing content. And I guess what I feel like the, this piece is kind of the bottom half of that pyramid or that uh, time uh, 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 hourglass a little bit where it's like, Oh, we're actually choosing a topic. And we're going to organize around and produce content that we're then going to push out in kind of a the, the amplification. We still get some of the amplification amplification effect, I think, because the community is co-promoting and co-interacting and has shared networks or whatever, you know, and they're focused on this one topic. And so that means that our public facing side will also be more successful. Um, um. So two things before I go to Pete and Klaus. Um, one is, gosh, um, the, the whole reason for Nuggets is to create something that gets that gets improved like Wikipedia gets improved. So I have a, 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 a riff on stocks versus flows and how everything is flows and we're drowning in the flows. So media streams or channels are flows of media and they're just flows to me. Um, media streams are composed of nuggets because each post or each podcast is just a nugget. And the visible ones, the ones that look like a web blog post or a podcast episode are mushrooms, basically fruiting body out of this mycelial web of nuggets that are getting better and getting richer and metabolizing information. And I'm still not sure that I'm explaining this very well. But um, but the, the reason to go to Nuggets is that it makes the production of things like podcasts and blog posts and sub stacks and all that relatively simple. And it lets them wire up to each other and get it, get better over time uh, in the same way that Wikipedia pages hopefully get better over time with good good participation and good editors. So, um, and so I would argue that dynamism is, sorry, I'll interrupt. I'm just going to, but the sure. dynamism you're talking about is really critical. I feel like that's been something I've not paid attention. You know, this, I thought the open was enough. It's not. It's open and dynamic that matters, right? And dynamic's the hard part because that's where all the incentive structures fail, uh, I think. So, so, um, and I think I'm wondering if maybe the, the nugget analysis, it's a little bit scarcity based kind of like I'm kind of arguing a nugget will appear because based? Uh, you're trying to be efficient 
you're trying to have efficient allocation of knowledge by consolidating them into the nuggets so they're easily redistributed. In my world, probably you'll you'll be able to maybe the AI organizes the nuggets for us. I don't know. Or you'll recognize a nugget because it shows up in four different channels. It gets picked up by other people because it, you know, if it's important enough in the flow, an idea will get repeated. So if it gets repeated across, you know, four or five of the different products, that's probably a nugget. Um, but it, it but they're kind of discovered ex post, not pre, um, and 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 put into the flow. So the flow, it's a, the the media channels are flows, but they're also stocks, right? I mean, the podcast is a, a permanent repository. Um, um, only, right, when it, written. only when it gets sort of stored someplace, but but you well, have a podcast by definition stored. Everything. Yeah, it's not uh, it's not organized efficiently, right? That's the piece. So if there's, but if we have a lot of people doing a lot of things, I don't care, you know. Um, cool. I think Peter has had his hand up before Klaus, and then somehow the you got flipped. I'm not sure. Um, I, he, I purposely flipped it. Uh, Klaus started talking before I put my hand up. That's what happened. Uh, so how would you like to run this, Klaus first? Yeah, class first. Okay, good. Thanks. So, yeah, so the conversation uh, evolved since uh, I put my hand up first. So let me try to catch up here. Um, I, I think, Dave, for, for your application, you want to set up a chatbot and then guard it jealously, right? Don't, don't uh, have uh, anybody mess with its assumptions and, and, uh, and its uh, uh, parameters um, without you knowing about it and without having uh, someone take a close look at whether that really is truly fitting in. Um, so I'm using uh, nuggets uh, uh, to basically evolve a story, right? I mean, I, I sort of track what people are talking about. So for example, my last story was the soil, uh, the role of soil microbes digging into soil hills the path to nutrient rich crops you now, because I noticed that the the conversations were drifting towards how does soil health, uh, ref, uh, the, the, the health of the soil biome relate and link to your gut biome. And right? so I, I, I uh, talked through this with the AI and, and we ended up writing an article here. Uh, and that really resonated widely, and it's already being picked up as, yeah, we need to focus on nutrient measurements of crops that are linked to the nutrient density of the soil uh, that, that is healthy. So you come in, so this is how nuggets evolve. So this is a freestanding nugget that may fit into a different conversation someplace else about you know, the, the soil microbiome versus your gut microbiome. So that's the idea about nuggets. But the important part is that you need an interface you know, between the, the GPT, the chat GPT itself, and people using it you know, and, and, uh, and, and accessing it, uh, if, if that makes sense. So you can have 10 teams working on the same uh, chat GPT. And in fact, that's a wonderful thing because you're training this thing you know, to think far more partly uh, and to... And to uh, and to look at what GRC is doing holistically, right, as a, as a whole, because at the end of the day, everything that uh, different groups within GRC do, are doing has the same underlying purpose, right? Uh, regenerative regenerative uh, uh, transformation. So, so that's uh, uh, where I wanted to go. So, so the and, and then there is value in it. I mean, if you develop a chat GPT that is truly knowledgeable, that dives really deep and produces, you know, great output uh, to, to questions, that has value. And if you, and the next step, what is really emerging right now is trust. Now, can I trust this source? So you are basically owning this chat GPT uh, if this thing starts screwing up, you are eroding your trust base, right? So you are responsible for uh, 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 hallucinations and what have you and avoid them. For example, I instructed uh, my chat GPT to not respond on anything with a less uh, reliability than 80%, right? So the, uh, the, the level of certainty has to be at least 80% before you use that. Now, and it will it will indicate to me that's a ninety five percenter, you know, and and so 
uh, so so you are you're avoiding you know, uh, these these uh, these pitfalls. So 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 I, I guess my, my my key point is ChatGPT is an asset. It's yours. You develop it. You own it, and you're responsible for it. Thanks, Klaus. <laughs> Go ahead, Pete. <laughs> Dave, did you want to respond to that real quick, or you just got a yeah? I was, I was a couple of a couple of things. So one is, oh, I met. I forgot to mention that we will like my uh, Regen Economics team will meet again on Friday. So we met last Friday. We'll meet again this Friday. So there is a little bit of continuing conversation. And um, yeah, I don't know. It, it's interesting, Klaus. I kind of like again the there uh i would have to imagine that there's somebody who wants to do the chat gpt in this milieu who would take responsibility for it kind of like I, there is no there's no nobody else right so um if there were people who wanted to do that then i would say great let's go do it i'm probably less focused on getting the right answer out of this than i am in having people explore it and learn about it um so I'm not trying to be very prescriptive in the what, so I don't know. I'm not sure you're. I, I'm going to take your wisdom about how to, you know, carefully guard the chat GPT and stuff like that. But um, I feel like really it's much more of um, people trying to get their wrap their minds around these kinds of things. I mean, like the podcast notion for me was podcasts are just great research tools. You get to go interview anybody you want, you know. So they would be a feeder kind of as much as they would be a product. Um, you know, that that kind of relationship. We're looking for ways that we can understand. And the other, I guess one other just little note that I did feel like Stacy, this was the, the the importance of creating the shared language, I think is one of the, you know, that's one of the things that could come out of this really is that we we just don't know, we don't know what each other's talking about yet. But if you have a lot of these conversations, the language will get much stronger. Speak, please. Um, I wanted to, uh, I, I really like uh, Dave's, Dave's idea of different media streams uh, and including a ch uh, chatbot as one of the media streams or multiple chatbots, different chatbots as, as different media streams. Um, I also wanted to note that you can use AI in the production process as well as in the output process. So it's a power tool for research and thinking about stuff uh, and uh, creation of content and all that. So uh, when we say AI, you know, it's it's different different places in in the Python. Um, I I also want to kind of uh, I want to continue to say that AI is super powerful, um, and I think people should use it. And I also want to be sensitive to people who have uh, some who, who want to go more more slowly um, in a more considered way. Um, uh, and maybe not even ever use an AI. I, I think I think it's worth thinking through that. Um, as I say that, it also reminds me that another thing to consider when you're talking about AIs uh, is uh, your choice of model and how it was trained. Um, so the big commercial ones that think really that they're really good at thinking, for instance, um, I, I like to use uh, GPT-4 because it thinks better than the other ones. Um, cloud three uh, opus is supposed to be getting there. Oh, we'll see. Um, a different consideration for using an AI, choosing a different model, you might want a model that hasn't been through the guardrail process or the you know the particular training process that one of the big commercial companies has used, and you want something more open source um, or something where you're not uh, shipping bits, uh, shipping information back and forth between a commercial provider. Maybe you want an open source LLM that's been more carefully trained uh, in, in some more circumspect way. And maybe you want to keep self host that rather than sharing all the chats with OpenAI or Anthropic or Google or whoever, Microsoft. Um, I'm surprised how much we're talking about AI here. Uh, I, I, I'm interested. Uh, again, I'm not sure that this is the place to talk about AI. I think that's a working group of, of new books, not not the neobooks people. Um, I also wanted to talk about, so now I'm going to talk more about AI. Um, uh, Klaus talked about having an interface to a GPT, um, or he talked about a particular um, particular set of personas that might use a GPT, uh, say farmers. Um, 
uh, farmers who are good at adopting technology when they need it and don't have time for um, crop technology or technology that's going to be too hard to hard to adapt into their their workflows. Um, lots of there's lots of different uh, personas that might use AIs. I the I, again from my experience teaching people how to use LLMs, um, and then my experience watching other people build GPTs. Um, I think we have we have a long way to go to make them easy. Um, uh, even even ChatGPT, which is you know tries to be so helpful and so easy to use, it takes a mindset change. I I watch it happen. People come to uh, ChatGPT and they go, okay, well it's got a text box. And I know how to use text boxes because Google trained me how. I type in you know uh, sky blue whatever right. And they think of, uh, they think of, they, they come in thinking ChatGPT is an oracle, like Google gives you the right information. Um, for me, after having worked with it for a while, ChatGPT is, it's weird to say this to people who haven't used it for a while, but ChatGPT is a thinking partner and a motivational partner. Um, sometimes it's an informational partner. Um, it, it, and it's a way to shortcut uh, longer processes. Like, like uh, I need it. I need three chapters on this topic. Go, and then it's it's got it later. Or um, I need a Python app that does this and this and this. Go, um, and instead of taking me an hour or two to do it, I get it done in three or four minutes. Right. So. Um, so I don't use it in Oracle mode very much. I don't use chatbots in Oracle mode very much. And that's a big thing that you have to teach people who are used to search engines out of, right? You also teach them how to deal with uh, hallucinations. Uh, you know, I, I, I like to say that a, a, have, calling it a hallucination or calling it lying, a lot of people say, well, the chatbot lied to me. I don't know why it did that. And it's like, dude, it doesn't have like agency. <laughs> it's just trying to give you good answers. It's trying to have a good conversation with you. So the whole lying and hallucination thing is, is comes stems largely from assuming that it's an oracle that's always going to tell you the right thing. It's like, that's for me, that's the wrong way to use a chatbot. A chatbot is a language power tool. It's not an oracle. Um, so there's a, there's a big learning process, I think. Uh, even when you tune up a GPT, a chatbot, a trained chatbot, when you train a chatbot to talk to people about a specific topic or something like that, or talk to them in specific ways, you still have to train the humans. You know, this is what this thing can do. This is what it can't do. This is the way you have to approach it to get the, the, the best information out of it. Um, you can build parts of that into the chatbot, and there's other parts you can't, really. So I, th I think... To, to kind of recap, when we talk about using AI, maybe we should, maybe we shouldn't. Um, uh, I think that's an open question. Um, uh, I think that that AI shouldn't take over neobooks. I think it should be a media stream for neobooks and just as important and not as imp and not overly important, just like a podcast or just like a uh, a discussion forum. I think a discussion forum is another uh, media out, output, another media stream for what we're thinking of neobooks. Um, so maybe, I, I think maybe we keep tripping over this neobooks thing, right? Maybe that book thing makes it too much about, uh, um, it's maybe too much of a noun instead of a verb. What I think we're talking about is helping people think and learn um, uh, with the idea that if we use nuggets, and I'm, Dave, I'm really intrigued by your uh, your analysis, uh, economic analysis of why why you might or might not use nuggets. But anyway, uh, what we're neobooks is I think it's a, a learning doing thinking process, uh, collaborative learning doing thinking process, uh, inspired by the idea of nuggets. Uh, and so then. Uh, uh, one, one more thing on AI, so I think I should stop there, but I'm going to say one more thing about AI. Uh, another thing about AI is you have to train people to use it. Um, I see uh, with my colleagues who are working on building training chatbots to do different things, they have completely different approaches on how that works. Um, some people have a question and answer prompt style that they, they um, tell their GPT to use. Uh, some people, um, and, and I, I can't 
express in a short frame um, the depth of that. Uh, I've got a, a buddy who spends literally like days crafting a prompt, one prompt, days crafting a prompt of how to combine and um, synthesize uh, information for a person who's coming to the, the chatbot. So when you come to one of his trained chatbots, and not even talking about uh, the, the corpus, just talking about the process of working with it, um, it's like a, a master's level course in whatever subject he's plugged in the, the uh, knowledge base for, right? Um, it's not like a simple thing where I ask it a question, it gives me an answer. It like goes through a whole process of, of helping you like a, a good professor would over the course of a semester. <laughs> Uh, he's really literally packed a semester's worth of pedagogy into this prompt wow. and then hooked it up to knowledge, right? So, and that's one approach. That's not the only approach. I think we're a long ways away from getting to the point where we have good GPTs and, and well-built GPTs. And, and also I want to recognize that it's not, we're, we're not quite at the place where it's easy for everybody to come to a GPT and know what to do or um, how to do it or how to get the best results out of it, right? So we're working on that. I see technology, you know, AI technologists, essentially working on both ends of that problem. How do we help people use it better? How do we make the chatbots more, uh, more friendly, more useful, uh, more um, powerful uh, over a longer uh, a longer amount of collaboration with the user um, in collaboratively learning and thinking and doing uh, a topic. There's a lot on the table and Jose, I don't know exactly how to catch you up. So I'm gonna let you float in the stream here with us. Um, Senor Witzel, please. Except I just forgot the point I was going to make. I was like, got in the, involved in listening to people. Uh, use the, use the chat just... to give yourself uh, a <laughs> little, little mnemonic aids. That I, whenever I'm trying to do that, I, I leave little hints in the chat that usually pop me back. I did. I I didn't do a good enough job with it. Like again, I can read one thought on the on the nuggets is again just kind of the messiness of knowledge, kind of that I just feel like we're trying to organize things that aren't organizable really. So you can organize them more, I suppose. And so there's I'm not against nuggets. I just don't think I would want to um, to rely on them. Oh, I know what I was going to say. See, uh, it's back. Thank you. Was so and 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 so to me, it's like the nuggets aren't really the goal. It's the it's the learning. I, I kind of get back to learning. So how do you enable learning amongst people? And part of it was I got to spend time with Bobby Fishkin this weekend talking about what he's been doing at Crowd Doing. And it's really amazing. I mean, he's he's kind of demonstrated the ability to recruit teams of volunteers and structure them in a way that they're really happy about being in that role. They choose their own box, as it were, and produce really valuable things. Um, and I guess that's kind of the inspiration a little bit for what I was thinking about around the regen economics thing is could we create a space where people are doing the things they want to do in a structure that's really productive and constructive and rewarding um, and and they're volunteering, you know, and we could have infinite volunteers kind of. I mean, we're trying this is this is part of the abundance thing is I don't have to be efficient because my pool of potential participants is, you know, global. Um, but anyway, I, something, you know, I just feel like Bobby really has modeled some really creative stuff around, you know, finding people, getting them into a place where they can participate, you know, helping them find work that's constructive. It's it's really fascinating. And is it crowddoing.world now? Is that his platform? Because all I had was a LinkedIn link. Yeah, you know, I don't, I've been trying to get him to kind of like, you know, it's Bobby, right? So when you get hit with stuff, you get hit hard. Yep. And um, and it takes me multiple conversations to like we can kind of understand what the hell's going on. So don't think there is a place where you can really understand all of the different things. Um, I mean, I could give you some examples of stuff, but um, but yeah, I don't, I don't think there's a there are no nuggets in, in, in Bobby's no, world. No <laughs> nuggets in Bobby's world. There's okay. just there's just mounds and mounds. <laughs> Got it. Hmm. Um, where does that leave us?
we, we've got another half hour, right? Yeah. 35 minutes. Um, I, I, uh, uh, um, I want to switch the, the topic a little bit. Um, I, I really, really, really want to help neobooks. And uh, I, I'm pretty sure I don't want to do neobooks. Um, so uh, my guess is that um, I, will, I will probably stop coming to the regular neobooks meetings. Um, uh, I'm happy to be called back uh, for advice or not called back to a meeting uh, just offline somehow. Um, uh, and I'm looking forward to working with Neobooks on Massive Wiki, publishing, whether or not it's Massive Wiki, um, some of the podcast stuff, uh, organizing information, uh, the theory of nuggets, um, how, how to combine nuggets and things like that. Um, so I definitely want to help. I definitely kind of want to be involved uh, in the periphery, and I probably won't be coming to regular meetings. Um, go ahead, Klaus. Yeah, Pete. So my, my, my question would be, what can I do? Because I got this first volume. It probably needs, I don't know, formatting, needs different pictures and stuff like this. I mean, how do I move on with this thing? Where do I go from here? Um, uh, I, I think another, the next step, well, so without thinking, without thinking yes or no about new books or something like that just if i were you what i would do is the next steps the next steps what i would do is uh get it out to 10 people five or 10 people who really read the thing and take copious notes and say klaus uh, this is a great book but here's some changes or uh, klaus i would split this up into six books because there's so much information here or um maybe uh maybe you need to, to write the guide to reading the bigger book or something like that, right? Uh, have some people really dig into it uh, from an editorial content perspective um, and give you some feedbacks and move forward on that feedback. Um, so you may or may not decide to do that. Um, it sounds like a pain in the ass uh, because it is. Uh, and you know, maybe it gets done, maybe it doesn't. From a production point of view, uh, uh the uh, you've already got it as a google doc right so um uh jordan and i when we did our our book publishing project uh we did an experiment with google docs and microsoft word uh to do the print ready uh formatting um it was inconclusive we thought we thought that we were sad that the google we tried google docs first google docs was we, we had some problems with the, the template they gave us, uh, uh, Lulu. Uh, it didn't quite work the way we wanted it to. So Jordan tried the next rev with Microsoft Work with Word with the same template, had the same problems. I, I, I think, you know, if you can read it in Google Docs uh, and you want to get it out in the world, um, you go over to KDP or Lulu uh, and give it, um, uh, I, you, you go through the process of publishing it. Um, publishing the print edition is not that hard um, and you just do it. You might have to go through a step where you take their template, copy and paste your stuff into their template. Um, uh, Jordan and I found that that didn't quite work anyway. So I, I think the what you wanna end up with is a, a PDF basically. So you, you print a PDF, give it that and it's good to go. Uh, there's another step where you also have to do the ebook edition. So the ebook edition, you simplify the the formatting and give it the ebook stuff. But I that that would be the next you know editorial uh, content. Um, maybe you want to do that. Maybe you, you don't. And then publishing, um, it's easy to publish. Um, a step that that new books hasn't really figured out yet uh, is marketing. So you know, uh, this is actually true of the AI anthology people too. Another another book publishing project I'm part of. You know, okay, now it's in Kindle, uh, or now it's in um, you know print on demand. Um, and the AI anthology folks, uh, we get to we got to go around for a day and saying uh, we're number six on the you know some incredibly narrow category that Amazon has. You know, we're number six on AI you know tools and practices or something like that. Um, 
and yet, uh, I don't know how many sales we've had. I'm sure it's in the you know handfuls of sales, not you know. So so then, if you care and you got a book, what do you do next? Um, kind of inspired by Dave's thing, uh, the other thing that that Neo Books is working towards, and that if I were you, I would work towards with or without Neo Books is how can I take this and repurpose this to different streams? How can I serialize this into Substack? Uh, how can I um, have podcasts around this material? How can I give chunks of this material to different people to write their own book uh, or to, um, uh, you know, write, uh, stitch together, you know, hey, here's a chapter, uh, or here's a subchapter, here's a chunk of my book. Um, could you write a book around this? Uh, and, and just as you're doing also, um, I would have uh, trained GPTs, uh, ch chat, trained chatbots, uh, ready for people to use, um, you know, to use the information. Like I said, um, it's easy for you and me to use um, uh, chatbots. Uh, it's not easy for everybody to use chatbots. So there's another step of trying to make the, either the chatbot so easy that anybody can use it, or train your um, your your folks, uh, whoever they are, uh, farmers or whoever, um, train your folks to be able to use the GPT. So there's that too. So there you go. <laughs> That's all you have to do. <laughs> so um, it's funny, uh, Pete, at the end of what you were just saying, you crossed over into what I wanted to come in and say. Uh, and I'll start with, Klaus, I may be over interpreting the way you started this call, but when you're like, hey, this is all about the AIs, I was kind of thinking you were no longer interested in publishing books and that you had corpuses, you had bodies of work, which you were generating with GPT, which you wanted to make accessible through GPTs, meaning chatbots that know about this corpus. And I, was, I, I didn't think you were still interested in actually publishing books. And the steps that Pete just described uh, for publishing books uh, totally, totally make sense. But, but the reason for nuggetizing, the reason for the approach I'm suggesting is that you can push a nugget out through our Substack. We created a Substack so that you could actually publish a nugget and then get feedback because Substack uh, is a way of getting a, a, a text out in front of an audience and seeing what they say and getting comments back from them because it has a comment system. The long conversation we had three or four calls ago about how to do commenting and whether we could have some architecture for getting you know, community to talk around nuggets was exactly so that we can figure out how to improve those nuggets and do editing around them. Um, our efforts to make the uh, massive wiki more of a wiki so that people can directly edit a page and offer their suggestions is also a way to make these nuggets sort of improve over time. But the way to, the way to get the way to, uh, to do a, a Tom Sawyer crowdsourcing or fence painting of the editing tasks for a book or a neo book is I think through community. And, and so a piece of what we were trying to do recently was, hey, let's, uh, let's send some of these nuggets out through the Substack as Substack posts, which are the new web blog, I guess, and then see what happens, for example. So, so that is a way to do a, a piece of this. Uh, there are still some clumsy and awkward parts about like making it all sort of smell and look like a book and then making sure that there are no errors when it goes through the publishing process. But, but at the end of the day, uh, Kindle Direct Publishing, KDP or Lulu Press seem to be the two most interesting and most accessible ways to go create a book once, it's, once you're happy with it at that level. But that, 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 the reason for nuggets is to have places where people can congregate and make something better. That's one of the big reasons for nuggets. And just to say the quiet part out loud, one of the reasons to have books is to market the, market the fact that you have ideas around a topic less so than so that people have an artifact with which they can read like we did in the 1960s or 1970s. Bingo. And, and this is only called neobooks because neobooks are cultural artifacts that are widely recognized. And with the mycelial metaphor, books are the fruiting bodies, the mushrooms of the work together. Uh, but they're only one. A podcast is equally uh, a fruiting body or a mushroom. And a chat access is a, a different form of mushroom. All the different manifestations of the ideas uh, wind up being the the known cultural artifacts.
What's the plot of Anatomy of a Fall? Uh, a guy falls out of a, a chalet in France and dies, and his wife and mostly blind child have to like, go to court and figure out why. Thank you. And there was an actress in the Oscars last night who acted in that movie and also is in uh, the Zone of Interest. So she got two nominations, right? Yeah, two nominations. Quite interesting. Busy, busy year for her. This is Sandra Hiller. Um, other thoughts this conversation is provoking. The every time we talk, I my brain can't help but go back to the idea that um, that we need an ecosystem slash platform that speaks to this, all of this, um, and facilitates the the understanding of what this is. If if we want to do eco books more than just uh, pardon me, uh, neo books, um, uh, as more than just uh, onesies, twosies, um, and that there is a way for people to wrap their heads around this. It's 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 a complex enough idea um, that without putting some structure out there. The structure, even if it's just structuring a whole bunch of the bits and pieces that we've talked about, but assembling it into what is perceived as a platform um, and speaks to not just the, the creation of a book, but the creation of a community of people who want to learn and teach together. Um, I think that I think that's well what we all want, and I, I'm hearing us getting caught up in in the focus on the book and the focus on how we do the book, um, and not so much on the focus on how we do the community that would do these things. And how we would have the conversation that would lead up to holding a community that would do these things. Um, for me, it feels um, like we're we're focusing on the the nugget and the and the technical bits, and not thinking about the desire to teach and learn together and collaborate in a way that would that would nurture solutions to these things um and that those those solutions would emerge from the community uh, if there was a, a vision of what that community of that ecosystem that platform could be um so that's that's my two cents and jose i forget when you joined the call because you might have missed Dave saying earlier a piece of what you just said, which was what's really interesting here is a learning community that's busy figuring out how these things fit together and making them better. And I am totally agreed with that. And I think we have, uh, this may only be visible to Pete and me, I don't know, but I think we have a minimum viable platform in Massive Wiki and in our calls and in our, our uh, the channels we have for communication like Mattermost and uh, the, the mailing list in the sense of um, markdown pages on GitHub are social objects that we can use and improve together. What we're missing is the community of collaborators who understand that and have jumped in the way Wikipedia has a giant community of Wikipedians who've been working now for uh, two decades uh, to build a, you know, a free encyclopedia for the world. 
in lots of different languages. So we don't we don't have a functional community doing this, but I think we have the piece parts uh, to do a minimalist version of the thing that we're looking to do. When, when we're talking about adding conversational features or comment features or whatever else, those are merely to improve our ability to sort of to do those th that collaboration and have that conversation. Um, Dave, then Stacy. Yeah, thanks, Susan. And and, um, and so the way I was like Jerry was saying, I'd be kind of imagining that we might have like a topic area, and we'd have essentially multiple production teams doing multiple products, if you will. So in the product that it costs, we would like the product could be a chat GPT, but it could be a book, it could be a podcast series. Um, and they're, but they're all kind of around the same nuggets, if you will. Um, and then there's a question of how organized the nuggets are. I've ended up imagining, this is, to me, this is one of the problems is that the coordinating is, is true. I don't know how Wikipedia did it. And we've not seen many more Wikipedias so it might have just been a lightning strike and we're never going to be able to repeat it. I don't know. But looking at my world now and like, or, you know, and like, I don't think everybody's going to come to this space, Jerry, and use the Mattermost and, you know, use it right. I'm going to have to go to where they are. So I mean, like I have some people who are paying attention to the GRC. They're meeting together. You know, if we were to spin off these product teams, those product teams are going to define their own platform for the most part, I think. You know, like if it's a podcast, they're going to come up with their own tools and they're going to coordinate around a podcast. And somehow or another, the problem will be the cross filtering back into the rest of the community, right? So that there is some kind of, you know, knowledge spinning through the process so that the knowledge is getting better. The learning is getting better. But um, there's a weaving component, I think, that might be essential um and 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 i do like the idea of trying to it's like look let's use like the the github as one of the shared resources if we're disciplined at that that will help our weaving and then you have to nag people a ton to get them to do that and they'll do it 20 percent of the time right i mean i don't know that's all that's my experience with the world right now and so um you know this notion that we're going to get it all organized it's gonna be tight just doesn't work anymore i don't think and you know, and I don't think we're going to build another Wikipedia either. So I think we have to figure out ways that are much more kind of spontaneous and uh, piecemeal and random to, to do this stuff. And just very briefly, I don't know that this is going to be tidy. I don't know that we're proposing that it is tidy. I think that the concepts we're talking about here are a way of converging ideas rather than letting them just splatter on the wall. And, and convergence doesn't mean that they end up in neat blocks. It just means that there's a sense of orientation, there's a sense of context, there's a sense of collaboration uh, in the medium somehow. Go ahead, Stacey. So what hardens me when I listen to Dave and Jose speak is that they're addressing something that I think gets the focus of the importance to go from the ground up gets lost in a lot of the approaches that I hear when they come from very from the technical community. So it's not a purposeful thing. It's ju it, ju it just happens that, you know, there's like a goal and you're trying to do something, but we forget, isn't the whole point to, to bring the bottom up and empower that? And that gets lost in some of the things other than what I hear from Dave and Jose and I'm I'm trying to inject, so. You know, and Klaus, you're right there in the middle. You're right there. Thanks, Stacey. Go ahead, Klaus. Yeah, one, one thing that I could envision is, and uh, we talked about this before, is to have a platform um, that gives you a general entry to NeoBooks and then gives you the choice to follow specific topics, which may be individual books or it may be a series of books within one topic you know like uh, nature-based solutions may have garden world and others and grc and other things in it and then give us the ability to use this as a link to go elsewhere with right so we don't have to build three or four platforms but if you build an ogm platform for neo books you know that that can then be accessed, you know, for, through my website or through uh, through other places, right? Now we have the credit that OGM you know, deserves for creating this whole thing, 
you know, you're creating an access platform, uh, you can do all kinds of things with it. You know? So that's, I think, is what we, uh, the, the Jose, and we, we talked about this before. You know? If right. I may go, then we can also play with it because if you are building uh, 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 rooms, right? I mean, you're building a platform with multiple rooms, then Jose can do something different in his room than I would do in my room, right? So you can customize it to to um, uh, my specific audience and, and for others. Yeah. All right, go ahead, Pete. Um, I like I like the question. Do we have a platform? Um, and uh, I I like the first part of your answer, Jerry. And I'm I'm kind of meh about the second second one, even though that's a surprising thing for me to say. Um, the first thing is like we have a platform. We have these calls. Um, so to have a platform, we need uh, a social platform. We need the ability for us to interact with each other, and then we need an external sociality too. We need to you know mix with the outside world, have people know what we're talking about, teach people how to think together, uh, whatever it is that NeoBooks does, right? So, um, so kind of let me come back to the way I started that. The, the most important platform is the social platform. And then in the platforms, we have internal platform and external platform. Um, so then let me switch from social platforms to technical platforms. Uh, Jerry, I, I kind of like and, and maybe don't like your answer about the, the technical platform we have. Um, it is the one championed by me. So I really love that part. Um, I also think it's the best. Um, I wouldn't be championing it because it, it wasn't the best. I think it's literally the best. Um, however, I also know that people want to choose different different technical platforms. Um, and in some cases, in some use cases or or socialities or whatever, even the massive wiki platform is not the best. You know, it's best for them to use blah. Um, the, the platforms I can think of real quick, uh, there's the massive wiki-ish one, um, uh, Markdown, especially Markdown is actually the important part, Markdown and files um, and a way to version the files. And if you start talking about ways to version files, Git is gonna be kind of the, the winner out of that, uh, even though there's other, other ways you might choose. So the, the massive wiki platform I think is the best. Um, Another one that's very commonly used is uh, Google Docs and Google Sheets. Um, uh, so Dave, that's probably part of what uh, many of those teams, the podcast team or whatever, are going to say, well, we all know how to use Google Docs. We all, you know, and pretty quickly, the whole group is uh, either better or worse organized, um, uh, but they have, they hopefully have a, a shared Docs folder. They start keeping track of stuff in Google Sheets. They have a bunch of written stuff in Google Docs. Um, the whole thing is really hard to find stuff in, and it's always confusing and messy. Um, and that's the best case. The worst case is you've got everybody's got their own Google Docs, and you share individual Docs back and forth, and it turns into a big mess. Um, I'm not. I'm not trying to make that sound bad. I think that's a, certainly a valid way to do. Um, it trades the. It, it trades off in a bad way. I think um, the the using Google Docs as the tech platform. Google Sheets and Google Docs. Um, using that as the tech platform trades um, uh, quickness and, and familiarity of starting versus utility and, uh, um, and flexibility over the long term. So Massive Wiki is a little bit hard to get started with. And then it just gives you back dividends of usability and flexibility and power and things like that. Google Docs is kind of the opposite way. It's like, super easy to get started because almost everyone knows how to use it and everyone's got a Google account, except then a month or two from now or, or three months from now, the whole thing has gotten pear-shaped and it's really hard to find anything. Just different, different styles. Um, Notion, uh, if you can get everybody to agree to use Notion instead of Massive Wiki or instead of the Google Docs thing, that's another great one. Um, Miro, for some, some people, some teams, that's, that's, that's what people use. Um, people even go uh, out into like there's teams that just do great with Discord. You know they need a chat thing, and everybody manages their, their own docs, but you can attach stuff into the chat. Some some communities are superb at using Discord for that. 
Um, Discourse would be another platform that you could use. It takes a little while to adopt it, but um, it's super, you know, super transparent in how you use it and and builds a, a great knowledge repository. So if you're building a knowledge community, you might bias towards discourse rather than discord, for instance. Anyway, long, long story short, um, I, I do think Massive Wiki is one of the, the very best things and it especially continues to give back um, in, the, in the out months and the out years. And it continues to uh, be collaborative and interoperative with many, so many other things that you win, I think, uh, including AI, actually. Um, so, and then lastly, uh, I would love to talk, I, I have a lot of interest and passion about how Wikipedia got to where it is, that it works and, and uh, how, you know, where, how it got to that thing. Uh, another, another existence proof of something like Wikipedia um, that's not quite as big, but is, is very, very successful. Another ex proof, uh, existence proof is WikiHow. Um, WikiHow is an amazing kind of um, start in continuing to cultivate story that is actually a nice counterpoint to Wikipedia. Um, Wikipedia is an amazing and wonderful resource, um, but some of the ways it ended up growing, uh, it got overly bureaucratic and WikiHow has a, a little bit different philosophy. So it's grown slower and it is smaller now, but um, it's also got a good collaborative community that, that works within it. There you go. Thanks, Pete. Rick? Yeah, thank you. Um, just some reflections based upon what, what people have said here. Uh, Jose, I thought what you were, what I captured from what you were saying was, well, how can we make uh, learning more dynamic, more enriching, flourishing, where people want to come and learn? Um, you know, it's, it's, it's the old intrinsic motivation of how people, you know, develop inquiry skills, curiosity, creative, co-creativity, whatever. Um, and, you know, Pete, what you were describing for me was, you know, there's so much out there. And the question is, how, how can we create sort of a hybrid of systems that allow asynchronous, synchronous communication where people can organically grow and develop interest and whatever? Um, and Klaus, I read your, your uh, uh, OGM um, uh, thing on nuggets. And I, I was thinking, well, you know, <clears throat> that is something that could be put on someplace where people can come and respond to that. And my response, which I haven't, uh, you know, come up with, would be a nice place, is where, you know, I think there's a typology of nuggets, and I think it's a bit of a broad term. Um, so you can have, you know, nuggets that are focusing predominantly on content, you know, the science of things. <laughs> Uh, then you can have nuggets predominantly focusing on process, which is the learning process, which enables the content. We have plenty of knowledge of what we need to do, but we're lousy at the learning process to actually put the content into it. And then you think about all the sort of, um, you know, cultural, social barriers for, you know, uh, elevating regenerative economics, agriculture, et cetera. I mean, it's it's it, it, there's so much there's so many barriers there, and really it comes down to how can we um, captivate our 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 collective wisdom to take on the meta crisis, um, because unless we learn how to deal with the meta crisis, uh, then we can't deal with the poly crisis of wicked problems. So how can you create this sort of dynamic learning community that would be intergenerational at different levels? I mean, that's the sort of I mean, it, it talks about completely transforming the future of learning. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm sort of wanting to sort of go more into the actual doing of this. And so if we were to take, for example, Klaus's, you know, posting on nuggets and put it somewhere and see if we can get a, a nugget conversation going about how nuggets can be used in different ways. I mean, it's just... Uh, you know, we, we spoke about this two weeks ago. I couldn't make it last week, and that was um, how to how we, how we how can we practice what we're preaching, basically, and learn how to do it iteratively, organically, emergently, yada yada. So, um, I think we need a little a little. You know, uh, Jerry, you mentioned we we got to 
start somewhere. Well, let's let's focus on one small piece and just experiment as, amongst ourselves using somebody's uh, contribution and and seeing where that will lead to. So uh, interesting enough, I just wrote a a blog post on um, sacred silence. And uh, in borrowing from indigenous wisdom, and um, uh, I'll share that that blog post because I I think unless we we enable sacred silence, we're so trapped up in the the you know the marketing fast paced world, ADD world, shining object world that we're so distracted that we can't really do any deep work, deep learning, etc. So, on that note, I will remain silent. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, Rick. Um, uh, I wanted to note that uh, Jordan Sukut is working really hard on solving the meta crisis and building a platform that that enables people to learn and grow and do and and be together. So Jordan's really doing that. We're really dedicated to doing that. Um, uh, it remains to be seen whether or not he'll be successful, but I, I wish him the best. Could you say what it was? I couldn't. Uh, could you say? Uh, Jordan Sukut is the the person, and Lionsburg is the name of the platform he's working with. Do you have a link or um, something that we can look at? Uh, Lionsburg .wiki. I'll put it in chat. Okay, okay great. Thank you. Uh, and it's it may be more approachable uh, if I I could uh, introduce you to Jordan. Um, <laughs> cool. Go ahead, Stacy. Since Pete brought that up, does he still have that? Um page that I think Forrest had put up of how you could apply for like if you have a proposal it was a very simple way to put forward a project proposal for funding is that still there uh, I don't know if they're doing uh, grant making right now um, even okay. um, and I don't know where a, a page like that is there might be one on on the wiki but okay. um, he's uh, um, started today actually uh restart jordan continues to kind of restart every every once in a while um because he's not got the uh the right the the an approach that's getting enough traction he restarted today on something called critical path conversations or something like that okay thanks it's going well i think jordan's jordan is continuing to go do good, great stuff he's also massive wiki's most avid user i think by by a league the amount uh, because of, it's the best, not be <laughs> the amount of the amount of pros he's put on on the Lionsburg wiki is enormous. He's he's got about uh, one point three million words um, and fifteen like a dozen uh, wiki books. He calls them so much work. Yeah, and then uh, I, I introduced Jordan to my partner, um, and because we have we would like to go into the Palouse uh, life, but we need funding, obviously. And <clears throat> and so uh, um, Jordan has a, a really well done organization in place. So let's we'll see where that goes. Cool. We are at the top of the hour, at the end of our call-ish, unless there's something anybody would like to add to it. Uh, Rick, you may have missed uh, daylight savings time. You're muted, so we're not hearing you. <clears throat> well, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> uh, uh, is it? I thought it was. Was it one thirty or two thirty? I'm I'm confused now. You completely confused me. So these calls start at ten thirty Pacific um, every it's, Monday. Yeah. Okay, two thirty. Okay. I feel like that's one thirty, Eastern. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. That's I didn't change my calendar. That's what it was. Okay. All right. Exactly. I, I was I, I was noting that you you'd come in kind of late, and I hadn't put together there was like an hour gap there. Uh, but yes, we uh, we had already been going for about an hour when you when you did join us. Okay. So so we're ready to wrap. All right. That's fine. Thanks all. Good. Thanks everybody.